There we go. All right. So uh, yeah, so we will not be covering any, we'll take a, a couple of uh, sessions break before we start repeating the uh, administrative, the DRE rules again. That, that was quite a bunch to get through. So we'll take a break for a few sessions. Um, just a reminder to everybody, I'm going to share my screen so I can show this to you. Okay. In case you have forgotten, if you go to remaxofutah.com, right? It's wonderful that we're on these sessions, but every once in a while, uh, we end up with a question that kind of crops up and it's like, yeah, I know we covered that at one point. And uh, make sure you know that on remaxofutah.com, if you go to the training vault, you'll see all the PV contract trainings. You'll also see all the uh, principal broker minutes. And when you're in there, you can search for things. So for instance, if I was going to search for um, contamination, there we go. It'll pop up if I if there's any videos recorded on that particular topic. It's not the most uh, complete uh, list of items, but hopefully either searching in the field up here or as you scroll, scroll through, you might be able to find what you're looking for. If you're looking for a particular uh, training on an addendum or a disclosure or something like that, we're getting a big enough library now that uh, you should be able to, to uh, uh, track it down. If not, you're always welcome to give me a call. All right. Um, this is going to be interactive today. So Stockton, I hope your AI is not tracking me and grading me. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk real quickly just about what you're seeing in the market. And then I have a couple of stat things that I wanted to throw at you really quickly and then uh, get into a particular addendum that I think is worth covering today. So what are you seeing in the market in the past week or two? What's going on? Uh, un unabashed, totally authentic, uh, assessment of what's going on in the market? Um, I think for the first time in a while, we've seen some movement with inventory. Inventory is going up a little bit. Um, so I don't know if that's, I haven't dug into the numbers enough to know whether that's because things aren't selling or because we have more uh, sellers wanting to list. Um, I'm hoping it's a combination of both, but I'm fearful it's you know the, the the bad one um right so that's a positive right we have yeah. some more inventory more inventory okay somebody counter dan dan's the perpetual optimist if you know dan at all he's always optimistic all right what's what what are some of the downsides what are you hearing in the market right now there's no negatives you got to be kidding me i've had lots of stagnant inventory from the files that i'm working on so okay. either they're going under contract really quick or they've been sitting on the market for like two months and not moving. Anybody else experiencing that? Ironically, I normally don't have inventory, but I have some SOI that just insists on me <laughs> representing them and we're priced pretty well and it's good property and it's still sitting. Okay. What about rates? Are you hearing any feedback from your clients about rates? Or are you not talking to your clients at all? <laughs> rates, rates still suck. <laughs> rates still suck. Okay. So, Brian, I'm glad you said it. And I'm glad that's you said a technical it. term. I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad <laughs> you actually said it that way. So, Brian, can I ask you a question? And uh, how old are yeah. you? How old am I? Yeah. I'm 43. Okay. So, I've got you by just a few years, like 15. <laughs> um, when Nancy and I bought our first house, you know what the rates were? No, it's not uh, like California. Like my over, parents, my parents had over 14, ten. My parents had fourteen percent in California. It's not that bad. Yeah, I was eight and a half percent on my first house. And I, yeah, I've shared this stat with you, and I hope it clicks with you guys. So not, I mean, listen, you're never going to get rid of the reality, but you can give some perspective, right? And the reality is, the average mortgage rate for the past fifty years. Anybody? Seven and a half. There you go. Seven and a half. Mm -hmm. So we are really at just an average rate, right? 
Now I get it, pricing's higher, but wages are higher also than 50 years ago or over the past 50 years. But I think it's important, especially if you're dealing with younger people, um, to to give them, don't make them feel bad for saying the rates suck. <laughs> you can sit there and be like, yeah, you know what, I get it. If I didn't know some of the historical trends, I would totally agree with you, right? So you're saying, I agree, you're not making them feel bad, but you're your future pacing say I'm about ready to reset your perspective, right? And it's like, yeah, the good news is we're really just about the average rate for the past 50 years. And from everybody we're reading, we're probably gonna be a point better in the next year, right? So I think it's important for us to be not just a one trick pony, like, hey, I can open a door for you, right? We're supposed to be a consultant for all things in the industry, whether it's investment or primary properties or whatever the case may be. And the fact that we're affiliated with lifetime home loans, if you are talking with your local LOs, they will reaffirm that they will do a, and I have to use this term with air quotes, right? A no cost refi you know, into next year when rates improve. What does that typically mean, Dan, when I use air quotes? <laughs> well, I mean, nothing in this life is free, right? So there's that. But but also, I mean, there are costs associated with it. They just wrap it into equity rather than charge the client out of pocket. The biggest thing is you talk to the LOs, right, is, well, we can't pay for their escrow funds and the things that are normally part of a refi. So they can't come out and say it's free. Now, the reality is you're going to requ be required to put some money into escrow accounts. But what do you get when you close out the original loan? Get you get a refund back. check for the vast majority of that. So there are a few little costs, but by and large, it is pretty much a zero cost refi. Right. And I hope you all have worked on a good dialogue with people. I'm, I'm, we're not going to spend the majority of the call on this, but I was talking with Parker about this this morning. As I as I go around the company and I talk with agents and Dan, you as a broker, I'm, I'm sure you've had these experiences. When you ask an agent, what's your dialogue right now to help people? Not, not, to, not to blow smoke in their face, but to correctly give them a, an assessment of the market and why now is a good time to buy. My experience is we're not super good at that dialogue. We've got bits and pieces and they're kind of hanging here in the air, but we don't weave them together into a good story. And I don't mean a story like I'm snowing you. I mean a legitimate uh, perspective-based story. Dan, you and I have talked about that. Give me just the quick quick uh, portions of what that conversation should have in it. To Tell say you you need to buy you really should be buying today and here's why if you gave him gave me three reasons why today versus waiting till next year. Yeah, interestingly enough, Brian and I were having this discussion just about a half hour ago um, about why we should uh, you know be pushing our well not pushing but advising our clients you know why today is actually a great market to be in, and I want to you know. Um, Pimp, <laughs> Rhett has an awesome slide deck on why today is a great time to buy, right? And for the, you know, to, you know, circle back to the initial comments of, you know, what are we hearing about the market? Well, inventory, right, is finally starting to creep up a little bit, and there's not that many buyers out there. So there are more options than there were just a few months ago. Um, and, oh, hey, we're getting some new uh, stuff here. Yeah, so Dan, it's almost like... It's almost like you and I choreographed this. You're talking uh, about inventory. Let me interject, and, and I want you yeah. to continue your thought. But if you look down here, obviously 2023 is in the purple, right? And if you look at 2020, our inventory was, you know, if you just highlight one of these, it'll tell you. Inventory in 2020 was 4,700. We're now at 9,100. So we're almost double the inventory uh, from two years ago. That's a good thing. Okay, go ahead, Dan. Sorry. Yeah, and with that inventory, we're seeing, uh, you know, we're, we're not seeing a much competition for that inventory, right? So, uh, so you, you're able to, as a buyer, you're still able to go to a seller, and you're still able to get concessions from that seller. You're still able to get some cash towards closing costs. You're able to, you know, get cash towards buying down the rate. Um, and so, our our lenders have abilities to, you know, make that seven and a half, not seven and a half, right? Um, and then we all believe, you know, that, that no cost refi, we all believe that in a, you know, 12 to 18 months, you're going to have a great opportunity to refinance, get that payment that you want, 
um, you know, for the long term. But today is a great time to be able to be in the market without competition. Let and, me ask uh, you a question, Dan. Yeah. Mm. What's going to happen when rates improve by a point by next summer? Yeah, I mean, we like all the national stuff I read and listen to, uh, and and Mr. Barton here himself. You know, we really do believe that by next spring when rates are, you know, much more competitive that we're going to be right back into that 20, uh, 20, 2021, uh, you know, market where there's going to be lines out the door at open houses. We're going to have multiple offers. And so it's just going to be much more competitive. And, 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 you know, now that, that, that slide that Rhett was showing six months ago where you had prices, your, your payments equal to, uh, you know, what they were two years ago, or um, because even though the interest rates are much lower, prices are down, right? And so prices are, are lower. And so payments, it feels different, right? Because 7% feels crappy, right? But the actual payments, the actual nut you have to crack is not uh, as bad as you think it is. And so educating the client, I think is really, you know, being that professional, that knowledge broker is really important right now. Okay. Very good points, Dan. One last thing I want to ask you. When they say something like, well, I think I'm just going to wait till rates come back to three, three and a half percent. Without laughing out loud, with all the love and concern of a parent, what would you tell them? I mean, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to come. I mean, I, I think, you know, part of me, of course, wants that, right? Wants that for my own stuff, right? But like the reality is, you know, I hope we don't get to a market where it's so crappy that we have to have a three, three and a half percent to make us, you know, to make things go. Um, but that's just an anomaly. If you look back historically, like three, three and a half percent is a just complete anomaly um, that, you know, happened to coincide with something that we haven't seen in 100 and whatever years, 50 years, a, a pandemic. Right? right. And so if we're going to get another pandemic, if we're going to get another crap economy where we have to dig ourselves out of it. I guess, but that does, that happens every once in 150 years. So all great points. Thank you for playing along, Dan. Um, <laughs> as you as you look on screen here, I, I want to point a couple things out. One, for a good portion of our population that's buying right now, um, they had almost a decade of 3% money, 3, 3.5% money, a decade. So unintentionally, they or subconsciously they, they think that is normal and it's anything but normal part of that was market conditions that drove the rate down but a large part of it was because of the government right buying back mortgage-backed securities they artificially deflated the market and the rate right and they did that to the tune of billions and billions of dollars every month for a number of years they don't do it anymore and so the market has said, oh, what should we really have been all along? Oh, we should have been up here, right? <laughs> and so this is, this is uh, to Dan's point, it, I, the best word is those years were an anomaly. We're now back to what we would call reality. <laughs> all right. So I'm just going to show you really quick on this graph. Hopefully, by, by the way, does everybody know how to get here? If you go to utahrealestate.com, you go up to statistics and you click the first button. This is what I'm on right now. And it gives you all kinds of data. So this is the active listings, but look at this, the green line, which is 2019, that's the last normal year that we had before the pandemic. And so I kind of use that as a baseline. Things were humming along good. They weren't great, they weren't bad. And so if you track the green line, that's kind of where the normal inventory was. So here we are, the purple line, we're still below normal. We're getting close, but when rates change and all that pent up demand comes and we only have a normal level of inventory, it's gonna drive prices higher. So those are important things to know. I wanna show you one more graph and we'll move, move off of this. Um, average number of under contract residential. So the last graph we were looking at showed inventory you know, going up, right? And yet, look at the number of under contracts we're actually going down so that is going to help add to some inventory it's not huge but it's i want to be realistic i want to argue both sides of the coin it is improving the inventory picture somewhat the downside of looking at this purple line is i was again conversation i was having with parker this morning was 
demand doesn't go away. It just gets tabled for a little while. People will move in with their parents. They will continue to rent for a while until it's so painful they will eventually buy. So when you see this, just realize the fact that there's fewer properties going under contract just means you're adding to demand. So that when rates increase and we're at normal inventory levels, it's going to have a compound effect. Does that make sense, you guys? And I don't know that you you go and and, and verbally vomit that on clients. That's maybe too much information, but it's good for you to understand as an agent what's going on in the next six to twelve months and where you should be going. Parker, what did I what did I tell you uh, we should be doing? Get fat on. You're you're muted or something. I can't hear you. Get listings. fat on listings. Get fat on listings. Get fat on listings. Hey, Matt, can I just ask you to repeat, just go back about, oh, I don't know, uh, two paragraphs from where you were and re repeat what you said. I'm trying to make sense of You're that. You're assuming I track what I say. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Specifically Fair about enough. what? Just, just a little bit about, uh, you know, talking to sellers along this blue line as, as we're collecting listings. Can you tell me a little bit oh, more? So, so this blue line is fantastic for sellers. If you're on the under contract listings, this is such a great stat because I'd be like, hey, listen, I, I want to always maximize the amount of dollars I get for your property, but we also have to deal with the reality of the market. On the one hand, I'm going to show them the graph where inventory is going up, right? That means there's more and more competition. And oh, by the way, the number of people actually pulling the trigger for the past four months, five months is decreasing. So mm -hmm. unless you are just trolling and doing this as a fun exercise and don't actually have to move to Nashville in the next you know, 60, 90 days, uh, then don't worry about it. But if you do have a reality that dictates you actually need to get sold, then we need to adjust our pricing accordingly or offer enticements like Dan was saying, right? Maybe we help people buy down the rate to get them over the hump or things like that. It just equips us. So it's not us just talking and saying, oh, well, the market we in the current market, you should be reducing your price. Well, most people, even my wife, who's an amiable, would say, yeah, why? <laughs> right. They want some data to back it up. So here's some data, some visuals to help you. All right. Spend a little more time on that than I wanted to, but that was a good discussion. Um let me change back over here. Um, actually, just, before... just just out of curiosity, or not curiosity, but just so you know, um, Matt and I, you, based on what you said earlier, you and I are about the same age. But um, Aunt Google says that um, historical interest rates peaked in October of two of nineteen eighty one at eighteen point six three percent. Yeah, my parents were lucky. They got 14, but there were others that were higher. Yeah, eight. can you believe that? I mean, throw that on a current millennial or a Gen Z and watch them have a conniption fit. <laughs> I mean, it's untenable, you know? So the last thing I would say to this is, um, does everybody know what our biggest uh, population demographic is right now? It's the millennials. It's the millennials. And if you look at the 10, 15 year range of the millennial population, the biggest portion of it is coming through into the house acquisition phase in 2024 is the biggest bump in that demographic of the biggest demographic we have right now. The, BAME, the, the boomers and the, the Gen Xs, they're slowly on their way out. I'm the last year of a boomer. I'm um, and I can tell you, uh, everything they talk about with boomers is, is accurate. You get a little later in life. It's like, yeah, I can't screw up my investments now because I don't have a lot of time to remake them. So I become much more conservative. I don't th throw as much money into the investment pool. Uh, and, and so you, you guys are stuck with your millennials, get used to it. And, and, uh, actually the good news is the millennials were delayed, but they figured out that real estate is their best wealth generating tool ever. And now they have become the biggest buyers. So, all right. Um, given the uniqueness of our market, um, we have various needs. And one of the things that we're seeing a little bit of an uptick in for any number of reasons, it could be because we're waiting for new construction to happen or, um, you know, uh, people aren't 
quite getting, the sellers aren't quite getting the next house, new construction or existing in a timely fashion, but they also want to capitalize on a buyer that's there today. And so we see more people using the, I should have really had this scrolled to the top, the short-term lease back addendum. Okay. Now, don't look at this yet. Eyes on the camera for a minute. Um, how many of you have run across in your own personal transactions, somebody just saying, oh yeah, we'll just take the blank addendum and say, uh, uh, seller or buyer to lease back to seller for two months uh, rent or some just ridiculously slim version of that, right? I see that and I start to like, my blood pressure goes up. Why? Why? Why does my, think principal broker, poor principal broker Barton, why does my blood pressure go up? There's way too many things that could come into play. I used to have a, a, like a, a, something similar to this that was written out that just had all kinds of things. This person needs to keep this insured. This person <laughs> needs to do this. This person, just everything. I mean, there's way too many things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Bill. I mean, that that is that is it in a nutshell. And I'd say in addition to that, when the, the, the problem is we really do think we're kind of attorneys, right? We think we're way better than we are. And the division says, oh yeah, you can fill out forms. And as a result, we think we can take a blank addendum and write in a short-term lease back with no detail whatsoever. I'm just here to tell you that you are taking on huge liability and risk when you do that. Because our licensure says that we're allowed to fill in blanks in a form. And that is not, that is generally not accepted as whatever you want in a blank addendum, right? The minute you start writing that, um, you you better have had that approved by an attorney or you are squarely in the crosshairs of the risk game, okay? I right, but you, it's- but I hope I, I made I, that stark enough. I wanted to let that hang in the air for a minute. You- I'll get lumped in, but I will show that we trained that you should be using the approved forms and therefore you take on the li the lion's share of the risk. Uh, you're putting yourself, your livelihood, and potentially your license at risk when you go cowboy like that. Right. Go but ahead, the thing Tom. is, if something is not there like that with the approved form, so way back when I did that, they used to have one, but then they took it away. So I kind of like took that one and edited it and whatever. And yeah, like I pretended to be an attorney, but it's, it, you know, it's like, what is the lesser of two evils? Just doing a two line thing, you know, sell it at least back for two months or, you know, doing something else if you're not going to hire an attorney to preview it. So, man, I am so glad you're on the call today, Bill, because, you know, you're, you're actually articulating some of the mindset that goes on with an agent, right? And the reality is, even though what you said was completely like rational and I'm, I'm trying to do a good job, uh, there's no mercy when it comes to the division or uh, for an administration, uh, administrative infraction or a civil case. They basically just say, you were out of your league. And what you should have done, right? Hindsight's wonderful. It's like, you know, we, college season is afoot, and if your favorite team lost, you'd be like, the quarterback should have done this. Well, that's kind of their approach. Um, and and their approach would have been, well, if there's not a form, then you should have got an attorney to write it for you. That would have been right. that would have been the but, default coming back. But the good news is, is UAR well, does have a form for us now. So right. Well, on the, but on the other side of the fence, everybody takes that stance because even. If me as an agent calls Matt as the broker and say, hey, can we get something like this through our company? No, because we don't want to be an attorney. So it's like, OK, then you'd have to go out and hire your own attorney. And <laughs> so I get it. But I also get. Hey, now, know, in so fairness, Bill, we do do some forms. I'm in the middle of a couple of them right now. But are we going to hire an attorney for every extraneous form? Probably not. And so. You know, there there is a fallback for that. And I don't want to go down a rabbit hole with this one, but in your client, I mean, if you went to your client and said, Hey, this is outside of the standard forms that we use to protect you, we should probably should pay the 500 bucks to have an attorney write up a form that makes sense for our particular transaction so you don't end up in a lawsuit. Right. So there's always an avenue. I know it's not easy, and I appreciate you uh sharing the reality of of what we deal with on a fairly regular basis. All right. So 
I want to go through this short-term leaseback agreement to show you all, hopefully at the end of this, you'll see all the things that are covered and it will scare you straight from ever just writing on a blank addendum. Yep, we're going to lease it back to the seller for two months. All right. <clears throat> I, uh, anytime that something is bolded on a form from UAR, I think it's probably worth paying attention to. So it says instructions of buyer and seller. This is a legally binding addendum to the Repsy. Now that probably glossed over most of you, right? It's an addendum to the Repsy. It's not its own agreement. It is actually incorporated into the Repsy. And you'll see down here in section one, it says the terms of this addendum shall survive closing. The general nature of the Repsy is once we've transferred ownership, the new deed and note that replaces the Repsy unless it has the verbiage survives closing. So this addendum does have that, which means your agency in regards to this portion of the Repsy survives closing. And we'll get to that in more detail as we go down below. So that's this is not an insignificant thing. It is part of the Repsy. All right. Um, buyer may be obligated to take occupancy of the property within a set period of time. Now, it's kind of interesting. They didn't choose these arbitrarily. Most underwriters say this. If you're not going to take occupancy within the property within 60 days, it becomes a what? Anybody. Non-owner occupied. Also known as an investment property, which has a different rate and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, yeah, um, you can see right at the tail end of this paragraph, it, it says that strongly advised, not only is it bolded, it's capped, strongly advised to consult with the buyer the buyer's lender regarding the potential impact of this addendum, especially if the rental period defined below uh, in section 2A is 60 days or longer. I have yet to really find a production lender that will allow you to go beyond 60 days. So this is pretty much a hard and fast rule, okay? All right, so we get to the main points. You can see all of them are highlighted in great. The, this is a lease back. It's not a, a, a your typical lease. They give it the appropriate uh, moniker so everybody understands. And here's the first thing that people don't realize when they freehand their own uh, blank addendum version of this. Section 3.3 .3 of the Repsy has some specific language, and this document is smart enough to address that. It says buyer or seller agree that the Section 3.3 .3 of the Repsy is modified so that the lease of the property is not by a separate written agreement. That goes back up to this section. It's part of the Repsy itself, okay? Which, by the way, anytime we have an addendum to a Repsy, whose eyes is that supposed to get in front of? Anyone? Who should be seeing that? The lender. Everybody. The lender. Uh, yeah, okay. Everyone, specifically the lender and the underwriter, right? And that's where we start to get into other problems when people freehand because they do it by way of a separate agreement and they don't let the underwriter know about it. And what is that loosely known as? Here's the real, oh. con here's the real contract. And here's what we gave to the underwriter. Fraud. Fraud, double contract, all things bad. Okay. So this is a, a first step in protecting you, your license and your clients. Okay. Section two, term of the lease back. Um, this is a big deal, but it's pretty self-evident, so I'm not going to spend time on Section A. But Section B, what happens if we agreed that I'm going to be in the property for up to 60 days, but I only stay in at 32 days? Well, you get to choose, and you get to define it. While everybody's heads are nodding, this is what we want to do. Getting the specifics in place is important. There shall be no prorated rent is the first option. If you leave 60 days early... That's that's my money as the new owner. That's option A or checkbox one. Checkbox two is, all right, we will actually prorate it, right? These are things, and as I read through this document when it first came out, I'm like, oh my gosh, if I had had this document so many years ago, I could have avoided so many problems because all of these, I've seen some version of it. Okay, third one is a big deal, utilities. Buyer shall be responsible for the utility charge uh, below. Why? Why is the buyer? Why don't they say the seller's responsible? 
Josh, I'm going to ask you. You look all handsome in your green shirt there. Why isn't? Why don't we default to it's the seller's responsibility? Um, I actually don't know the answer on this one. I just always know that buyer, well, buyer has responsibility of the property and ownership of the property. Property. So utilities, typically utility companies, want the owner to be handling the utilities. There That's you handling. go. That's the default answer. So your your instincts were right. Um, anytime you buy a property, uh, depends on how proactive the municipality is. They want the actual owner showing on the utilities, right? So that's why the contract defaults to that. It says though on the second half of this, if no if no box is checked, then the seller shall be responsible for the utility charge. But by default, it's the buyer. And you can get very specific if there's also, if you're including Xfinity, Comcast, whatever, you can write it in the other field. I know this sounds trivia, trivial, you guys, but um, there's no better time to get the details ironed out than at the front end. And when you get the details ironed out at the front end, you head off at the pass greatly the ability to have a conflict somewhere down the path uh, during the lease period. Okay. Now notice, uh, I was thinking about this. What happens if we say, yeah, uh, I, as the buyer, I've got to put it in my name, but you, you as the previous seller, who's now the tenant, you're still going to be responsible for the utilities, but they're in my name. Well, that typically means me, the new owner is going to pay it. And I'm looking for reimbursement. And even that's covered right here, right? You got seven days after what? And the devil is in the details. If if Josh was the the new owner who's not in the property yet, and he paid the utilities but never invoiced us, right? Now remember, this is part of the repsy, and section eighteen of the repsy is very specific. All notices <laughs> must be in writing and signed by the party giving notice and delivered. So when it says seven calendar days, buyer providing seller an invoice of the utility charge. Yeah. Uh, if you don't do that, then you have no claim because you haven't performed your portion of the contract yet and you can't demand reimbursement. Okay. All great things. Now it, it talks about those things. And then it says this, the second portion, notwithstanding the utilities above, meaning water, sewer, natural gas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Buyer and seller agree that during the rental period, seller shall be responsible for payment. Seller, who's now the tenant, shall be responsible for all payment of cable, satellite TV, and internet, and landscape maintenance. Believe it or not, seen that one. They are no longer the owners. They're living there, and they stop mowing the lawn. What do you, what do, you do if you're the quote-unquote new landlord buyer, and they stop mowing the lawn? Go ahead, Josh. You uh, you pull up this document and and read it to them, review it with them again. Okay, that's the nice first step. And then if they're still resistant, then what? I'm not sure. Um, I guess you, you hire a, you hire a landscaper and bill them. You could. Yeah. But you know what? It's even worse than that. Down at the tail end of this, it says if the buyer does not perform the terms. Of this lease, it is a default and you can terminate the lease. So quite literally, you don't mow the lawn, I can kick your butt out. Now, that's not what I would choose to do. I, I like your approach better, Josh. I'd be like, hey, listen, you agreed to this. Here's the stick that I have that I could use that I don't want to use. So please just mow the lawn. Right? And water the lawn. And water the lawn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And it even talks about city snow, water for irrigation, right? Snow removal and other things. Um, and it also says that the buyer, the new landlord, will be responsible for any HOA, right? Okay, security deposit. Now we're getting into the brass tacks of this. This is where structure is so important. Okay, so security deposit, seller shall agrees to deliver to the buyer no later than closing. I love that they put this verbiage in, especially as a landlord myself. I don't want to chase money. Right. If you if we're if we're if you're selling the house to me and you're going to become the tenant, then at closing, part of your closing costs is going to be the security deposit. All right. Those of you that are landlords, what's a good security deposit amount percentage of uh, rents? 
A hundred percent of rent. At least. On mine, I go double. Yeah, well, go ahead, Bill. It just depends on the market because for my experience in co-owning a property management company for a while, we actually went with 95%. The reason okay. is if you're at 100 or 100 or over 100, they have the psychological thing that my deposit covers the last month of rent and they don't oh, pay. Oh, we've got you covered on this one, Bill. I'm getting there. So let me just say this. I like a bigger stick <laughs> if needed, right? The bigger the stick, a lot more pain can be exerted. And not only that, think about this. It's not that hard for them to come up with two times rent security deposit. That's what I do on my rentals, by the way, um, because they just closed on their house. They typically have equity. <laughs> so putting up two times the amount is typically not hard for them. Okay, but to Bill's point, we're going to get well, to that. I, I mean, I was referring more to a property management, like someone has a rental property, sure. they hire you to manage the property, yep. they're not selling a house and buying a house, and they don't have a bunch of, you know, so it's, it's a little bit of a different application. But anyways, for sure, for sure. Okay. Uh, you, you said that they, they may want to use that as rent. Look at the very next line. Seller shall not have, meaning the tenant, the new tenant shall not have the right to apply the security deposit towards payment of rent. So structure. And I get that. And all of the leases from the Utah Apartment Association from as long as I can remember say the same thing, but that yeah. doesn't change their, you know, the, the tenants. And again, I'm not using that in this situation because this is a different, this is like a purchase. But so I'll just shut up now. But, but that's yeah. okay. No, it's, it's a good point. And you're right. Some tenants will try to use that, but uh, it's much better to have this verbiage in there because if I have to take you to small claims to recover, I've got the verbiage in here. You already signed off on it. Nobody held a gun to your head. You signed this at the time the lease was taken. And yeah, it's a little extra work, but I can go recoup my money. Okay. All right. Here's the next line in section four. Um, refund of the security deposit is subject to the requirements of Utah law and is dependent on the seller's compliance with all the seller's obligations under the lease back including delivering the property as it was at the time they bought it. And then how long does the new landlord have to return that money? So let's say we have a two month lease. I have up until day 90 to get your uh, uh, security deposit back to you. So again, another thing I've dealt with in the past, it's like, well, we moved out. We need our money right now. It's like, well, if, if the landlord wants to do that, they can, but contractually, they have the provision up to 30 calendar days to get that money to you. All right, right of entry. So we get this one. I, I've had this two times in the past year. Well, we're doing a lease back, but we want to be doing some improvements to the property. We want to replace, re, replace the tile floor, and we want to replace the countertops. Can you do that as a landlord in a normal situation? No. When you do a lease, they're entitled to quiet enjoyment of the property. Otherwise, you're you're essentially doing a constructive eviction <laughs> by make it, making it uh, unpalatable for them to stay in the property and they can turn around and sue you. So no, you can't do that. So if you've got a client that's going to be doing a lease back and they're talking about stuff like that, future pace them. Explain to them, you can't do that unless we get something in writing that says, you know, from nine to one every day, you can have contractors in the property. Most tenants are not going to agree to that, by the way. All right. Section seven is a close cousin to that. No alterations to the property shall be undertaken without the seller's prior written consent, right? And then the last part of that paragraph, in the event the property is damaged through no fault of the seller, right, who is now the tenant, the seller's not going to be liable, and the buyer's primary recourse is to file a claim with the insurance policy. So if we have a terrible storm and things flood, just because you're the tenant and the former owner doesn't mean that uh, it's not the landlord. Think landlord-tenant relationships because hey, that's really what you've created. Yeah, Parker. Just a quick question on, on the deposits. Um, it, it asks us there how the deposits are going to be paid. Now, I always put through electronic wire transfer at the time of closing or, you know, whatever the situation is or a couple of days before closing, whatever. Yeah, I get a lot of people asking, like, well, can I pay it through Venmo or something like that? And that's fine, right? As long as we put that in there. 
Well, sure. Back to your point, the default of this contract is the security deposit specifically, not talking rents, the sure. security deposit um, is due at closing. Now, listen, I've seen some agents and their clients structure this saying not only the security deposit, but the two months worth of rent. Let's again, assuming we're doing a 60 day lease back will be paid at closing. I want it up front. I don't want to chase it. Now to your situation, uh, that's how I do my rentals. I don't, I've never taken a check. It's all paid via Venmo because then I don't have to deal with, oh yeah, I put it in the mail, right? So, okay. all right, let me get to the other financial on this. Um, I, I'm gonna, I'll circle back to section eight on the default, but section nine, this one is important. I put a little note here, see if I can pop it up. Yeah, make this amount huge. <laughs> so I've had several instances of this where the previous owner, who's now the tenant, agreed to 30 days or whatever the amount, and 30 days comes, and they say, oh, our house isn't ready, so we're going to stay here. And and the buyer, the new landlord, is like, but, but, but what do I do? I'm like, well, you have a tenant now, and there's laws that govern that. You can't just come and change the keys on the property and throw their stuff out on the street. There's laws that govern landlord tenant relationships. So if you want to avoid that problem, then put a big A number in section 9A, right? And basically it says in the event, the, um, the rent amount in section two of the lease back is left blank or zero, buyer and seller agree that the rent for the holdover period shall be. So if you start going past your uh, originally agreed upon day, I would put it, you're paying me 300 bucks a day. Right, that's nine thousand dollars. Uh, it depends on the property, but I'm going to put a big amount there, and I'm going to put it per day, so I don't have to debate if you went a full month over or whatever. But I'm going to make it really painful, so you're a good actor, right? Now, this is kind of in that category of oh, that's kind of hard to talk to a a tenant about. Well, remember, it's not a tenant, and this is all being negotiated while everybody's in a good mindset and high spirits and want to get the transaction done. And it's very easy. I do this with buyer brokers when we talk about the protection period. Now, listen, Dan, I know you're not this person, but this is provided in here to, to cover situations that the you know we've seen in our industry. Again, I know you're not that person, but we put this amount in so that if for some strange reason you did become that person, uh, it would be very painful for you. What's Dan going to do? Is he going to sit there and say, no, Matt, I really am that guy. <laughs> well, I don't want to sign it because I really am that guy. You have a captive audience at this point. Make it a high amount while everybody's heads are nodding the right direction. Let me put this very succinctly. If you have a high amount here, you're probably not going, probably not going to have problems. It heads it all off at the pass. If I have to pay $500 a day for being a bad actor, that gets really spendy really fast. Okay. All right. Told you I'd circle back to section eight. What actually constitutes a default? The following events. So you have items A through E. We're going to rattle through these really quickly. Failure to pay rent. Well, Parker, I gave you a scenario where you don't even have to worry about A if you get it paid for upfront at closing. B, failure to perform any uh all or any part of the lease back or a violation of the lease back or any of the rules re regulations adopted by buyer or of any law that's a cute little catch-all at the tail end of section b if you don't perform by based on any rental law you're now in default i can you're kind of at my mercy now section c if you take off from the property for more than 15 days and haven't and haven't paid rent I can terminate the lease. If you pay your rent, or if you give me written notice that you're going to be gone for 15 days, you don't have option C. Option D, uh, this is a, a big one. Viol and pay attention to this. Violation by the seller and occupant. So if I invite a friend over, right, to the property as the tenant or any guest, if they violate any state, federal, or local ordinance. So I'm going to go with, you know, my favorite, my 420 example, right? In certain states, smoking pot is legal. Is it still a federal offense? 
The answer yes. is yes, it's still a federal offense. So by this definition, if if somebody's smoking pot in my house, you've now violated the lease. I don't care if the state says it's okay. I don't care if you got, you know, your your uh, medical card or whatever. It's still a violation of federal law and I can I can instigate a default. Okay? Um, and then E, if seller holds over and fails to vacate on or before the required move out date, and that's kind of self-evident. If you're there beyond the terms of the lease, that is a default and I can kick you out. Okay. All right. Um, section 11, this is the other, this, this page is the other big one, which is liability and insurance. So let's quickly hit those and we'll wrap up. Buyer shall not be liable for personal injury or damage to or loss of seller's personal property, right? Um, even though I'm the owner and I will have some level of owner's insurance, you're contractually giving me an out, right? And you think an insurance company would take advantage of this section? I mean, if it's the seller's insurance and they're asking to pay out a claim, yeah, it's pretty nice when I've got verbiage that I can be like, you signed a contract, said you couldn't come at us, right? Kind of hard to defend that, uh, to, to prosecute that in, in court. And basically this is the section where you're telling them, uh, get some renter's insurance, cover your own property because my insurance isn't going to cover it. So seller's insurance, who's now the new tenant, that's where it says, now remember we said, if they don't abide by the terms of the contract of the lease, they're in default, we can kick them out. So they're actually contractually obligating themselves to have renter's insurance. It doesn't say how much, but if they don't have it and you can request written proof of it, if they don't provide it, they're in default. Now in fairness, uh, the, the buyer or the new landlord is required to get insurance as well. And they give you a nice little notice here saying, hey, you know what? We can't speak for all the insurance companies, but uh, you probably, before closing, it is strongly advised, strongly advised to consult with your insurance agent to determine and obtain adequate insurance for this um, scenario, this lease back scenario. All right. And then the last section is a reiteration saying, hey, um, just because we went to closing doesn't mean your agency is terminated, you still get to help in this, but there are guardrails on what you are required to help with. So section A says uh, the leaseback does not create any brokerage or real estate agent obligations to manage the property, to collect rents, to engage in professional activities on behalf of the property. So even though you're still uh, attached to it, you're technically not a property manager is what this is saying. Okay. And then section B, the lease back does not create any brokerage or agent responsibilities regarding buyer or seller default under the lease. So much like a property management, I mean, it, it's sad that they have to reiterate this, but that's also sometimes what a property management will do. We'll start the proceedings against somebody to, to recover damages based on a default in the contract. And the, this contract is saying, no, the default is we're not going to play that game. If you're going to do that, you need to do it as the landlord, okay? If there's something that contradicts that, it must be agreed in writing in a separate agreement, okay? All right, so having gone through all of those items, do you see why <laughs> writing your own leaseback addendum is a really bad idea? It really is. Um, uh and, and this is just one example of many documents. Listen, I'm the first guy to tell you that just about every document can have a tweak or a modification to make it better, or there might be something that I'm not 100% favorable of, but I promise you, it's a way better place to be than writing it on your own. I'll take the attorney written and reviewed uh, an approved form any day over what me or any other agent writes on their own. Any uh, any feedback on that? Any uh, questions in regards to that? If you want a copy of my highlighted version, send me an email and I'll uh, send it back to you after we're done here. Uh, where are we on time? Oh, look at that. We're 
we have uh, three or four minutes. If you guys, do you guys have any specific contract or negotiation questions that you've run across in the past week? That doesn't have to be short-term lease back based. Anything that you're seeing that uh, you have a question on? Go ahead, Josh. Um, so I've got a deal that I'm about to get under contract. We all know that right now in this market, wholesalers are are pretty uh, pretty expansive. There's quite a bit of them here in Utah. And how do we handle a transaction for a client that wants us representing them in a wholesale transaction that the wholesaler is bringing to us with their own, what do they call it? A um, assignment contract? Yes, yes. <laughs> so that is a little loaded question. I'm going to answer it, but really we, maybe we should, maybe we should spend uh, one of our next um, sessions on that. Okay, so for those of you who aren't familiar, wholesaler, um, basically the best way to think of them is somebody who's trying to be a real estate agent without being licensed by the division of real estate. And the, the loophole that they find protection under is in the state of Utah, there's two forms of title. There's legal title and there's equitable title. When I gain an interest in a property, a purchase contract, even though it's not exercised yet, the fact that I have an equitable interest in the property gives me some property rights. And that's what allows wholesalers to do what they do. Now, specifically to Josh's question, we have an assignment addendum from UAR. And so what happens is Josh's client or anybody else's client uh, becomes aware of Dan, the wholesaler. I always pick on Dan. He's my favorite. Uh, who went out and secured a property from Susan. And unbeknownst to Susan, Dan said, I'll buy your property for $400,000 when in reality it's worth $470,000. That's why Dan's being such a nice guy and offering to pay for her home. And he slips in the purchase his purchase contract with Susan that he has the right to assign it, right? And Susan, not having done, done a transaction in 10 years, it's like, oh yeah, that's great. Dan's such a nice guy. And she signs the contract, right? And then uh, Josh's client finds out that Dan has this contract, even though it's not on the MLS or anything else, and says, hey, ran across this property. I'd love you to represent me in this. And it's this weird situation where this guy wants to assign me his contract. Now we're in the thick of, uh, of a wholesaling transaction. Um, I've seen wholesalers used this, uh, use the state approved purchase contract. I see a lot of them with their own contracts. Um, if they're going to assign it, Josh, my first line of defense is that's fantastic. Um, my client, if, if we're going to pay you $30,000, because that's really what's going to happen for Dan, he's going to, he's going to turn around what I say is worth four seventy. dollars um, Dan's going to turn around and, and sell us the contract for 440 or something like that. So Dan's going to make, you know, his 30,000 off of that. And Susan's still going to get her 400 that she's so happy about. Um, and, uh, I, I should say the purchase price is 470. Dan's going to take his four, his 30,000 or whatever his amount is. The re remainder goes to Susan. Um, but I would always start with that's fantastic. Um, I'd like to use the um, UAR approved assignment addendum. Why? Why? Why would we use the? Come on, you better have an answer. Because the we're same, not the same we're reason not an I just talked about. <laughs> All the same things I just talked about. Because I don't want to write something, and I can almost guarantee you they didn't have an attorney write theirs, and that doesn't take me off the hook. My fiduciary of reasonable care to my client is to protect them and do what's in their best interest. And if I know somebody else is using a form that they just concocted and puts my client at risk, I'm not fulfilling my fiduciary of reasonable care. I know that the UAR's assignment addendum actually was reviewed by an attorney, written by an attorney. And even though it may take a little jerry-rigging to make it attached to their original purchase contract, I'm pretty sure I can do it, right? And it's going to cover things like, okay, who is buyer A? Who is buyer B? What's happening with earnest money? What about disclosures? Were they all disclosed to, are you accepting them from what was disclosed to Dan because he's technically the first buyer? Did you have a chance to review it? There's a lot of detail in that assignment addendum that UAR wrote, much like the form we just covered. All the scenarios you typically don't think about 
a lot of them are covered in the assignment addendum. And so I would utilize that. I'll come full circle, Josh. Our fiduciary, one of our other fiduciaries is obedience. Now there are parameters on obedience. If we're asked to do something illegal, we don't have to obey. Is doing a wholesale transaction illegal? It's not. So if you have an agency yeah. agreement with, with a buyer and they're wanting to do a wholesale agreement, your job is to help them navigate in the best possible way what is a legal transaction. Parker. How I guess tell me what our risk of running into like a like a, a double contract is when you're dealing with assignability. I haven't dealt with many assignability. Yeah, so it's not it's not a double contract. Start with the end buyer, right? Typically, and I'm painting with a very broad brush. Please don't call me out. We don't have time on this call. Is you're presenting one offer to the underwriter when in reality the offer is this, but it's 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 all umbrella under one buyer. In this situation, it's more sequencing. Dan has an offer with her, and it does have the language in there saying that he can assign it. And ultimately, Josh's client is going to be the buyer. There's no no double contract there by the definition I just gave. You're not hiding something from the underwriter. We would take Josh's client, we say we're buying this transaction essentially from Dan and the original owner is Susan. And that's all known. It's all documented in the transaction and it all hits the underwriter's eyes. So one final question on that, Matt. Um, yeah. If the wholesaler asks us as the agent to receive his contract as if he is assigning the property to me and then asking me to do that responsibility that I have that buyer's agent responsibility with my buyer how do how do how should we handle that <laughs> anybody want to take a stab at that if you know me at all <laughs> um don't I mean your job is somebody's agent you should not become a principal in the transaction when you start becoming a principal who uh, I, this was kind of my advice in my broker minute or two last week. Even though technically we have the ability to be a power of attorney on behalf of our clients, even the division of real estate, their lead investigators, like, don't do it. Don't do it. So much, I would answer much in the same way, Josh. Um, okay. If they so, ask you to do that, say, no, we have other ways we can structure this. Let me show you how. Okay. All right, guys, I really appreciate you being on the call today. I hope uh, you're uh, going to have a fantastic week. I mean, listen, life doesn't get too much better. It's college football season, and uh, my USC Trojans are number five in the nation, baby. <laughs> Dan, don't be a hater. Don't be a hater. <laughs> the question is, is Utah going to whoop them again this year? That's the you question. You know, it's a good question. I will be at the game with my fi extended family in the Coliseum. So I, I hope the answer is. Oh. That's maybe. a sore topic for Matt. <laughs> it is. Well, so make, make, sure, make sure to take your earplugs because last year after a nice mountain bike ride and I was watching it on TV at my home, my buddy was sending me a text message of his screenshot from his phone showing how the noise was going to cause could cause ear damage if you didn't have protection so just just make sure you you take care of yourself there man the good news bill um i've rocked out for so many years my ears are well damaged so <laughs> yeah bill you, you could tell his ears are damaged because all of us are telling him how much usc sucks and he just doesn't he doesn't listen to it <laughs> Hater, <laughs> haters gonna hate Haters going to hate. All right, guys, listen, have a great day, and thanks for being on the call. Thanks, Matt. Thanks.